Applications were equally amazing in their diversity and scope. They represented 90 countries on six continents with populations ranging from 50,000 to well over 10 million. Applications were written in seven different languages and notably 70% came from the developing world. Once again, we faced a very tough decision and working once again with a distinguished panel of judges, a final winning group of 35 cities emerged. So 35 cities out of 330 quite strong applications. So I'd like to announce the cities. Pittsburgh, United States. Everyone. Um, this is a really big day for the city of Pittsburgh. It's a, it's a huge win for us. We're really proud to announce that we are um, one of the newest members of Rockefeller Foundation's 100 Resilient Cities. Um, and uh, this is a credit to the mayor's leadership, um, our sustainability manager, Grant Irvin, and a coalition of partners that have been with us since the start of the year in trying to identify uh, various risks and vulnerabilities of the city, but also ways that we can come up with uh, more holistic integrated strategies to not only improve our resilience but also um, address some of the most pressing social economic concerns for the city and going forward I think this is going to be a, a very uh, huge step in our ability as a city to move forward uh, around resilience so with that I like to uh, have the mayor talk thank you chief um, Deborah's being a little bit humble. She, uh, before she came to work for the city, was a consultant to global cities around the world, mainly the C40, the largest 40 cities in the world, where she actually worked with the Rockefeller Foundation in helping those cities to achieve this once they were awarded it. There was a first round of resilient cities. 33 cities were awarded a few years ago. Uh, this is the second round. Rockefeller Foundation is spending uh, $100 million to be able to work within 100 cities to create models of resiliency. Uh, for Pittsburgh, what does that mean? It means everything that we do and how we do it so that it can be sustainable and be able to be able to withstand any challenges that it may have. Uh, in ways thinking about it on the next several years, our combined sewer overflow, how we address the issue, how we build the systems out for our waterways, how we deal with the crisis that we still have within our air quality, and how we deal with all the issues around it collectively by working with a team here in Pittsburgh and now being at the vanguard of cities around the world in one of the 33 cities chosen and working on a global basis to address these issues. We have a seat at the table on a global stage now, and that's what's really important. Uh, Rockefeller recognized the importance of what we were submitting, uh, and that was done by the input of leaders throughout Pittsburgh who have been working on this issue on both a local and national stage. Now they have the ability, too, to work on it on an international basis. Uh, but I have to give a lot of thanks to our sustainability manager, Grant Irvin, because he quarterbacked this effort and found the talent throughout this city to put together one of the most impressive applications out of 331 that Rockefeller saw. Uh, and with that, I just want to introduce and let you walk through a little bit of what we can expect over the next few years, our sustainability manager, Grant Irvin. One last thing before Grant comes up. This isn't the only grant, competitive grant, this department has been able to receive. This new Department of Innovation and Performance has been receiving competitive grants since the beginning of the year. They've been proactively going out. And at this day right now, this department and the other departments throughout the city, we've been able to receive nearly $40 million in grants just this year, a high watermark for the city. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chief, and thank you, Mayor, uh, and thank you for all being here today. It's a great honor and a great pleasure, and, and I can't say enough really to thank you both because it's really your leadership that has allowed us to be courageous and to find the opportunity to pursue these types of global initiatives and be a part of a global stage where Pittsburgh really deserves to be a participant and to be a leader. Uh, so with that, I'm grateful and very thankful. I'd also like to thank the people here in the room. So 
for the media, some of the people that you see here are a part of the team that helped develop this application. Members of the private sector, the leading members of our business community, nonprofit leaders, design and architecture, our university sector, our nonprofit sector, and city employees. Resilience is really an interesting thing. It's a new term for us. We, whenever you know, you bring up the topic, people ask, "Well, what is it? What is resilience?" And I've always had the challenge of explaining sustainability first and foremost. And now we have a new, a new term that we have to introduce to Pittsburgh. When we talk about sustainability, we really think about endurance. It's the core, the root of the word. It's about how we can become an enduring city. But resilience is another step. It's really thinking about being stronger, being able to adapt, to take whatever challenge comes our way, and not only only bounce back but to bounce forward. The Rockefeller Challenge really provides us an opportunity to initiate that conversation here in Pittsburgh for the first time in our history. But what's interesting, being resilient is a key piece of our history. It's a core of what it means to be a Pittsburgher. We know what it means to be able to endure, we know what it means to bounce back, and now we know what it means to be a stronger city. So this for us is really about a pivot to the future, to think about how we can engage and collaborate amongst the different parties here in the room, but also with the leadership from around the world. So learning from the best and the brightest, not just in Pittsburgh, but how we can share that message and learn from others in places like London and Chennai and Tokyo and Yokohama and Sydney. So now it's about a conversation that we can share and we can learn from which is really exciting. Rockefeller gives us also the opportunity to kickstart uh, this initiative by hiring a chief resilience officer, by coordinating and directing staff capacity that will allow us to dedicate greater resources to sustainability and resilience within the city of Pittsburgh and our operations, but also with our partners. It also gives us the opportunity to access technical resources, the time and talent of some of the leading firms and institutions from around the world that can help us address some of the issues that the mayor mentioned. So we're not floating alone any longer, but instead we're bringing together uh, some of the greatest around the world in terms of urban development, in terms of research capacity, in terms of finance, and in terms of the human experience. This is one of the things that we learned in our roundtable several months ago that helped build this application, was it's really about people. It's about people that make a stronger place and how we can build that foundation for a greater future for Pittsburgh. So once again, I thank the leadership that we have here. I thank everybody in the room. And we're on our way now. This is a journey, and it's going to be exciting. Yeah, I'm going to ask if you can answer some of the questions that are specific sure. to the grant application and then the specifics on the programming itself. Sure. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Can you? explain for people who don't have the vocabulary of urban planning or cities, what are you talking about? <laughs> Tell Pittsburghers what, what this means. Is it a reward for something that's already happened or uh, a, uh, a means of accomplishing something that's still ahead? And give some specifics. Sure, it's a little bit of both. Uh, you know, So we were recognized because of the competitive application that we put together. But it's also the network that we were able to build to tell Pittsburgh's story. So because of the global nature of this initiative, just putting a, a bunch of great words on a piece of paper isn't exactly it. It's because of the leadership team that the mayor has been able to form. It's because of the initiatives that our university and private sector and nonprofits, you know, that Pittsburgh story has been a part of what is championing this application and, and its success. You know, so the, the simple question is, it's been a team effort in order to get us to the point where we're at today. The next step is really about a, a planning initiative. So understanding how we could use the resources through the Rockefeller uh, Foundation and the 100 Resilient Cities to design a game plan that allows us to take what they consider the challenges, the shocks. So think in terms of uh, weather-related events like a major storm or a flood. How do we address those issues as a local government, as a community, as a, a private nonprofit sector? But it's also about the stresses. So these are the long-term issues that we confront. So think about issues like poor air quality or poor water quality that we have engaged with over years that we might turn a blind eye to just because it's something that is in the background. We know it's an issue, but it's something
something that doesn't need to be addressed today. It's not a crisis. But if we don't address those crisis, those issues that are long-term stress, they become a crisis. And that's really what this is about, is to help us to figure, you know, as a community, how do we address those near-term impacts that could be major catastrophes that we can address from our homeland, uh, our Bureau of Homeland Security and Emergency Management? How are we prepared? How do we guide resources and direct those resources so that we mitigate the impacts of those shocks? But it's also about how do we start to put the policy and the investment in place to address those long-term stresses so they don't undercut the work that we're trying to do across the city. So just to add, add quickly, so I mean, at the at the end of the day, there are uh, things that we already know about in terms of shocks and stresses, identified risk um, that we can predict and know, and these are the flood risk that Grant talked about, some of the other things related to extreme weather impacts, but there are other things that we can't predict. We won't be able to know every single thing that could put Pittsburgh at risk. What Rockefeller and what Resilient Cities does is provide a framework that allows allows us to not only respond accordingly, but acknowledge a certain level of unpredictability um, and be able to respond and recover and continue to bounce forward to uh, promote the longer term vision around our social economic impact. So this framework and this thinking really helps us uh, plan for this certain level of unpredictability. So um, just to, to continue with that, you have department heads who have different areas of responsibility like public safety. What's a resilience officer do? Since you have a resilience officer, it's different than people who deal with these things every day. Is it a big picture job? It. What? Sure. So one of the things that we identified in the development of our application was kind of three things: the ability to convene coordinate and communicate. So this is one of the, some of the things that we heard from the community in terms of what a CRO or a chief resilience officer would do. So it's the ability to convene different sectors, to work across sectors, to create avenues where uh, collaboration can occur. It's about communicating. It's about educating what resilience is, what sustainability is, and how in whether it's uh, your individual business model or your organization, how you could structure your operations to be both more sustainable and more resilient. But it's also about keeping that story together and coordinating the city towards a higher purpose. So looking to address some of the long-standing challenges that we have in a community fashion. Can I jump in with that? So it, it doesn't take away from what's already there, but it's not a public safety position. We already have emergency operations that works on a public safety sector for it. It's more like a planner, but it will be housed in uh, innovation and performance so that we're measuring and working and developing and planning and measuring and working to make the city as resilient as it possibly can be. So we'll look at the big items, the big items being the ones that are the long-term risks. And there have been the same long-term risk in this city since David Lawrence and R.K. Mellon created the Allegheny Conference, the first environmental organization in Pittsburgh. And that's right, it was, because its job was to clean the air and clean the water. And now what this role will be is to continue with that legacy, but in a whole new way. So as we look at our CSO and Pittsburgh being our combined sewer overflow problem, Pittsburgh being the hub of it all, we don't want to simply build a bunch of pipes that will need to be repaired in 40 years and be replaced in 100. We want to create systems around it in order to be able to mitigate how much water has to go into those pipes. And now we have a person who can work and plan with that. With the people that are in this room, you don't have people who are strictly trained in public safety. You have people that are planners and designers that are architects and those that work on resiliency issues with public safety too. Now we have a quarterback to bring all those people together and partner with cities around the world and say, what are you doing about this problem? How are you solving that? And working to get best interests in a very small fraternity, the Rockefeller 100. And we're in that second tier, so there's only 66 of us. And right now we get to work and to be a part of that. And this person gets to be a point person of pulling all those things together. So although resiliency seek comes to mind in ways that we we protect the public if we think about the problems that we've faced in the past and when we, we did the interview with Rockefeller we talked about this with the problem of Washington Boulevard the solution that we have right now is to put a gate our resiliency officer's job will be to figure out how to make it so the gate is never needed so we never have flooding like that that when it rains really hard people won't die we want to get to that level 
And that's really what this person's job is, not simply to be another public safety official, we've already got our public safety officials, but to be someone who works between all of those different organizations and comes up with the game plan. So the city getting money? Yes. How much? Well, there's a hundred million that Rockefeller has dedicated to it. I don't know if they divide it equally or... Yeah, so that's, that's yet to be determined. So we'll get resources to help on the staffing side. But the other piece that's really interesting, and it goes to, to Bob's question also, which is the amount of technical and private sector capacity that will now be at our disposal. So for example, the finance industry and the reinsurance industry are lending their efforts to support the Rockefeller Foundation as well. So this brings in you know, large firms like Prudential and Swiss Re and Microsoft that will be at, you know, at our, our call with regards to questions that we might have with everything from uh, IT security to infrastructure and design and construction. So it's that technical capacity in addition to the staffing support that we'll be able to leverage as well. It's not, a, it's not just environmental factors you're talking about. You, you, up until now, you've been talking about largely environmental factors. But when you mentioned IT, and because I think of the biggest shocks to the city, we've they've been economic. That's right. That's right. And that, that's what's kind of the interesting piece. So one of the first things that we'll do with, with Rockefeller, is, as, as Chief Lamb had mentioned, is this planning component. So understanding within our current context, what are some of the threats and shocks that we face? We've already identified some and spoken about a couple, but like the economic issues. What, what is the undercurrent with regards to how do we create a more diverse economy? So if a component of our regional economy were to collapse, let's say, like we've already experienced, how do we address that. So how do we diversify economically? The other issues could be, uh, you know, London is a good example that I've learned about as the second cohort. Their application was really geared around cyber threats. So understanding the challenges that we have in a connected world, how do we protect ourselves if an IT issue comes abreast? So these are some of the things that we'll be evaluating in our first phases, phases of the framework. Mayor, if you can address or sort of elaborate on, is this a gold star for Pittsburgh? Boy, Pittsburgh has a good job, does a good job of being resilient, or is this like, hey, this is a town that has problems ahead. Mm -mm. So we sat down with the Rockefeller. Uh, the, the, it was not only the application, but there was a, a two-hour interview with them as well. And one of the things that they liked about the application was the fact that we were looking at our legacy of a post-industrial city but looking to how do we change that for our future. So in a way, I think that they look at Pittsburgh as a model that can be used in the Rhone Valley in Germany or, or in other industrial parts of Turin in Italy or different other cities. And how we address the legacies of air quality and water quality, which was part of our application, uh, is can be a model for other cities around the world. So it, I don't think that they looked at it and said, because you realize other cities have volcanoes and they applied for the, how they become resilient to volcanoes. Other cities have earthquakes, and they did it for earthquakes. What we did is we looked at sustainability of creating systems that will last, of putting in place different types of operations that realize that as we go through climate change and all these other things, that we have to be prepared for it. And we don't have the capacity right now with our, our infrastructure or other things to be able to handle it. Long-term planning can help get us there. You mentioned that, that air quality and water quality were part of what gave your application. Was, it, was that the major thing? Or? It was one of the major things that we came up with, um, recognizing the history that we've had and a lot of the current challenges that we're working to address right now uh, with regards to air and water quality. And the mayor had mentioned the CSO issues, also a lot of work that we've been doing with partners like the Breathe Project and others around trying to improve Pittsburgh's air quality. These are things that we know of. Um, like Chief Lamb mentioned, there's things that we don't know of that we want to try to investigate and explore. But those are two that are critical. If we don't work to address them, it hurts our long term competitiveness and that's something that we don't want to see. One more thing to add is that at the end of the day, I think what makes our, the application stand out and something that the mayor cares deeply about is all these different shocks and stresses impact people differently in terms of your level of vulnerability. And something we need to ensure is that some of the most vulnerable neighborhoods, some of the most vulnerable areas and sectors is something that we need to focus on, on building holistic resilience rather than certain pockets or sectors. And so our application really focused on the people um, to ensure that 
given that these are the devil, different levels of shocks and stresses, we recognize that not everyone uh, experiences those shocks and stresses at the same level, and that we need to ensure that how to ensure uh, that level of resilience is for all, all of Pittsburgh, and something that the mayor was very adamant that we focus on. Thank you. You're describing an exceedingly complex set of systems, not one system, but interacting component systems, which to me requires a lot of integration mm -hmm. and a first-class information system. So how are you addressing the questions of integration of information and then providing a common a profile of the current status of the city where you are now, where you it's a great question. I mean, a lot of our work in this first year uh, as the Peduta administration has been establishing baselines from a sustainability perspective, really understanding things like our energy consumption, our water consumption, different investment levels in different, uh, you know, economic opportunity zones. So where we can target resources to be strategic with issues like combined sewer overflows or uh, understanding places to make investments in our transportation infrastructure. So understanding that information collecting that information, you're exactly right. It's, it's essential, and we've started to do that at the city level, at the regional level, statewide, national, and global. And we've done that through reporting uh, and making information transparent through initiatives like the Carbon Disclosure Project. The first time ever in the city of Pittsburgh's history, we've joined a global conversation about climate change and mitigation. And also in terms of identifying where those target zones need to be in the city. One of the things that catalyzed this, this conversation was some work that uh, Carnegie Mellon had championed through an undergraduate class in terms of first the first analysis ever on adaptation and mitigation in Pittsburgh. So understanding the challenges that we face with regards to increased precipitation as well as potential heat or swings in, in temperature. I mean, last winter we all experienced the polar vortex. The big question our, our group around the table asked, what if that happens more frequently? frequently. What, what if we get more increasing rain? How do we address those systems? Um, and first place that starts to do that is understanding the data, understanding where to collect that, and how to coordinate it. So this could be its own press conference. I'll let Deborah address it if need be, but that's why we asked Deborah to create this, or head this new department of innovation and performance. I, I've said it often that up until last year, our information capacity danced to an 8-track of Duran Duran. I mean, it was uh, way out of uh, sync. The, the, it was siloed. It was all over the place. Some of the programs that some of our departments had were created specifically for that department, and some of the companies were just local companies that it didn't, you couldn't even coordinate it. So since she's come on board, and we put similar people in. Lee Haller at Public Works was a consultant with Deloitte master's degree from Carnegie Mellon. He's now the assistant director of public works. I mean, that position is always held by a Democratic Party war chair, you know, not someone from Deloitte. But he works directly with Carnegie Mellon on upgrading all of those systems, being able to uh, utilize technologies. And then it all goes through Debla, so it's become seamless. Uh, Mara Kennedy, who's earning her master's at the Wharton School, is upgrading all of what used to be called the Bureau of Building Inspection into permits and licensing and getting it to all be online, but it has to come back through Deborah so that it's seamless. Even our authorities and the parking authority, we now use handheld cell phones in order to do the ticketing, but that's all coordinated so that it can all operate together. You know, worldwide cities are on the cusp of something huge in technology, but we don't even know where it is. This puts us at the table. This is why we wanted to have this department. And now we're being recognized for it and we're going to be rewarded by being a part of all the cutting edge stuff that's going to be happening and have somebody who's working within city government that can make sure that what's happening in Asia or in Africa or in Europe is going to be able to be known and a part of Pittsburgh city government. We still have some more capacity building to do. You're right, there's a lot of systems that need to be upgraded, but we've dedicated the revenue through our capital budget. We've got the talent to be able to recognize it, and um, we're moving there pretty quickly. Any other questions on this subject? Yeah. Uh, I'll ask a real quick. You talked a couple times about the, um, planning for stuff that you don't even know what it is yet. <laughs> Right, so what does that actually involve? Like, how are you going to make the city more resilient for a place that you don't even know what 
Ghostbusters. Well, did you ever see the movie Ghostbusters? I did. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. <laughs> when, he, when he's there with the bishop, or the cardinal, right? <laughs> the mayor. Right. <laughs> I guess I'm <laughs> <laughs> to me, that's what I would think. I think a giant marshmallow man would come knock down Melon Bell, Melon's building. <laughs> no, but to these folks, it's probably something much different. <laughs> I, I think part of it, <laughs> I just got the marshmallow yeah. man in my I think a part of it is being a part of this network, really. Um, you know, already in the past two days, I've had the opportunity to experience uh, what other cities thought in their applications. Uh, so learning what is on not just the cusp, but uh, learning from different portions of the world what are their challenges and how they're addressing them is a key piece of building our own knowledge base. Uh, you know, in the last several months, I mean, we've our learning curve has grown rapidly with regards to an outward focused participation in, in national and international organizations, which creates our knowledge capital, allows us then to take that knowledge, disseminate it, and apply it here locally. Uh, and that's probably one of the best things I could say in terms of forecasting what's coming down the pike. We don't know, but if we have an idea if another city has experienced these same types of activities, we now have a network that we can tap into to learn and apply those lessons that they've learned from. I'm kind of on the Ghostbusters mm -hmm. here. Uh, so the city's <coughs> going to get some kind of grant, right? Money, yeah. cash. And that's going to pay for the resilience manager? Yep. Okay. Uh, is the city kicking any money in on that? Or is it no. Completely paid for it? Yeah. But you don't know how much the city's going to get. Correct. Yeah. So, I mean, this is all going to be a part of the evaluation that we'll do with Rockefeller and understanding, like, currently we have a, a really strong executive and managerial team. So part of it is going to be understanding how we can build that team out by providing technical expertise and leveraging what we already have uh, here locally at the municipal level, but also with other partners. So having that conversation with the community is going to be really critical so that we can apply it to the, the nonprofit and, and private sector as well. And you're also going to have access to a large uh, base of technical and uh, experts. That's right. And where do these experts come from? They, they belong to the foundation or they're volunteers? Do you want to talk? I mean, Deborah has been a part of that. They're, they're hired by uh, the Rockefeller Foundation to provide um, expertise and you know they're uh, you know designers engineers uh, architects uh, urban planners uh, a wealth of uh, financial advisors around insurance just a wealth of different expertise dependent on what the specific issue the city needs um, so you know for example if the city has um, you know earthquakes you know they'll hire some of the best systemic um, engineers to to look at it and work with the resilience officer um, to build um, uh, capacity. How uh, long does this last? The, the it's financial grant is two years, uh, so it's a two-year commitment on behalf of the Rockefeller Foundation, but really that's looking just to kind of kickstart this initiative. We would hope that, and they hope as part of the grant, that this is something that gets woven through city government. So the idea that resilience uh, is not a one-time effort, but really becomes an enduring and a lasting part of how we conduct business at the city of Pittsburgh. Can they help you negotiate with the nonprofits? Uh, I, I don't know if that would be. Not sure. Not sure. So when do you hire a resilience officer, and how much specific aid do you get for that? Well, they're going to work under IMP, so they're going to have to make less than the, the director. <laughs> uh, uh, we, I don't have a salary that's that's in place yet. They would be uh, hired as a uh, a high level administrative official. Uh, our salaries are lower than other comparable cities, so I think we'll be able to bring them on board for a pretty decent price and have some money left over to hire consultants and others to help them to do their job. I they go away after two years? I think the grant pr provides the funding for the position for two years. For two years, but that also gives us, I think, the opportunity to think how both through kind of operating budget as well as other local philanthropic and private sector support that we can create an enduring and lasting legacy. 
Yeah, I, I think your question is really, um, we really hope that resilience can be institutionalized uh, into the city and institutionalized in terms of the thinking, in terms of the decision-making process, and we will work during this course of the period in thinking about how to institutionalize it going forward. When will you What's the next step? What's the next thing that's going to happen? So the next step is that we'll execute the grant agreement with the Rockefeller Foundation, and then in early 2015, we'll uh, begin working with the foundation to create a scoping and an agenda, uh, which will allow us to incorporate the team that we've already assembled uh, to help build the application so the people uh, that have been around the table will continue, and that will exponentially grow as well. All right, thanks, everybody. We'll be available after. Okay. All good? Great. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks, team. Good job.